So I would like to call to the front um, uh, the next panelist uh, for uh, our panel on multinationals. So we have gone through medium-sized companies, uh, startups, and now we are looking for discussing some of the major agents in, in change and improvement of productivity, the multinationals. Uh, and to do that, I would like to invite my, my dear colleague, uh, professor of organizational behavior, uh, good friend, uh, Charlie Galunek, uh, to come to the podium to introduce the panel. Uh, Charlie and I are working together on some research on this area. Uh, he is the Aviva Chair Professor of Leadership and Responsibility. Charlie? All right, well, I'll ask my panelists to come up to the front first and grab a seat. Yeah. All right. So we're moving up the food chain uh, in organizational size and, uh, and complexity. And the companies that you have before you today, they're, they're true multinational companies. And not just in the spread of their products and services, which of course the Mittelstand uh, have as well, uh, but they have true global footprints. Uh, they are very spread out across the world, uh, and they have some type of global strategic logic uh, to the things that they're, uh, that they're doing. Let's see if I can get the slide up. If I can get the slide. Um, so there's a couple reasons why I think the, the MNC perspective is particularly important. Um, and uh, it, it, I think it's partly because of the roles that these companies play. Uh, the first role is that they have a fantastic vantage point because of their spread, and they can teach us a lot of different things about uh, global competitiveness, not just Europe, but the comparative advantage of Europe to the other regions. And I think this is very, very important for our, our, our conversation. Uh, but secondly... Uh, they make choices, and we can learn from their choices. They make choices every day about where to invest, uh, where to source talent, uh, where to pay their taxes. Um, and they make these choices, and these choices really are, are the foundations of that global competitiveness. Because if they're moving out of one region and into another, uh, this should tell us something about the global uh, stature of that, uh, of that region. Uh, the two types of questions that we're going to be looking at uh, with this panel... Uh, one centers on uh, diagnostics or descriptives. We're going to try to understand more about the European disease, if you will, or the European advantage. Uh, what is the uh, return in Europe, uh, return on Europe? In what sense is it positive? Uh, in what ways is it negative? Uh, so we'll get through some of that. We're also going to look at some things that are a little bit more normative or applied or practical. Um, so what can we do to help improve Europe? And in particular, what is the role of multinational corporations in that, in that work. Um, the panel that we have is uh, extremely well placed to speak to these uh, various issues. Uh, let me first of all explain that uh, this panel has a logic to it. Uh, Javier and I have been working on a research uh, project in the last nine months, and that project involves looking at global competitiveness. We've been talking to a lot of multinational corporation uh, executives. And we've been looking at various industries, but within each industry, uh, we're looking at one company based in Asia, one company based in the Americas, normally North America, and one company based in Europe. And uh, we hope that this will give us a rich uh, comparison of the different regions and some real insights uh, into what's going on in these uh, various industries. Uh, so let me quickly uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, we have uh, Rajesh uh, Krishnamurthy. He's sitting right in the middle there. Uh, Rajesh is uh, head of the consulting and systems integration practice uh, for Infosys. He's a vice president of Infosys. Uh, he's also responsible for managing the enterprise solutions business uh, and ecosystem for Infosys. And this includes various consultants and vendors and partners and all the rest of it. Very complex work. Uh, secondly, we have Nick Leader, who is sitting uh, right here. Uh, Nick is, uh, first and foremost, he's one of our own. Uh, he's an NCAD uh, alumni from 1995 MBA. Uh, he's the managing director of Google France. Um, something I did know, this is one of the larger market markets for, uh, from Google. Uh, he's, also a, uh, he's also spent some time with Google in Asia. He was the managing director of Google Australia and Google New Zealand. And finally, we have Nunzio Martillo sitting at the end. 
Uh, Nunzio is the senior vice president of, uh, of Ericsson. Uh, he started uh, with Ericsson in 1988. So quite a lot of experience uh, with Ericsson. Uh, he's the head of the Mediterranean uh, region. Uh, he leads 25 different countries in the Mediterranean region. Uh, 25 years experience with, uh, with Ericsson. Uh, he's an electrical, uh, electronic engineer by background, although he's branched out since then into sales and, and marketing. Lots of international experience for him as well. Um, now before we begin with the, the questions, uh, Javier is going to say a few words about the research findings that we've had, but also there's some other research that we've done, uh, that Javier has done through the European Competitive Initiative, and uh, he's going to look at some of the survey results from uh, thousands of alumni who've, who've uh, given us some insights around European competitiveness. So, Javier, do you want to? So uh, very quickly, I would like to share some results on some uh, two research projects. Uh, one that well, those of you among the alumni community have heard about, which is the INSEAD European Competitiveness Survey. Um, and then also some of the insights from the work the, that Charlie and I have been doing. Um, the, the importance of these surveys is to provide a, a way to benchmark. So how is Europe doing in terms of competitiveness? So what are the things that we are doing well or not? And this will provide input to the panel. Um, this uh, spring, we decided to do a survey on European competitiveness um, uh, supported and in a way um, a collaboration with the Harvard Business School, which had done a similar study um, for a US competitiveness uh, based on HBS alumni. So what we did is that we used some of the same questions as they did. Uh, we used the same methodologies to, in order to be able to compare like to like the responses on these areas. One of the questions that we ask is, how is Europe doing today in terms of the business environment relative to other advanced uh, economies? If I could have this slide, please. And what we found is that there is, of course, a, a variety, but for European uh, context uh, based on INSEAD uh, alumni, they felt that 21% of them felt that Europe was actually doing better or much better than other advanced regions. While for the U.S. and HBS, 64% thought that the, the, the U.S. was doing better. So maybe this is uh, American optimism, but clearly there is a signal here that, of, of course, although Europe is very competitive, they, they, it may not be as competitive as it could be. Now, we also ask them about the trajectory. Are we going in the right direction? Is the, the trend moving, uh, pulling ahead or, or falling behind? And on that direction, you see that uh, only 4% of our alumni actually thought that competitiveness in Europe was improving, while 38 were thinking that it was falling behind. Uh, this compares with 14% and 20% respectively for, for the US. So on both directions, the current state as well as the, the, the trajectory, we are not doing as well as, as, as some of our peer advanced nations. Then we try to um, understand what are the basic conditions, what are the reasons, uh, the specific dimensions of the business environment in which the US and Europe are competitive. So what we did is look at 17 dimensions of the business environment. And basically here you are gonna be looking at things related to the basic infrastructure to do business, things related to the political environment, the type of decisions that the governments do to support the business, uh, things about the effectiveness of markets, so how quickly labor and capital moves around. And finally, things about the management, the, the visible hand that allocates resources within the companies. So our survey is based on 2,700 responses. The HBS one is based on 7,000. And what we do in this graph is that we plot the current state of a particular dimension, so whether something is a strength or a weakness in Europe, and then the trend, so the perception of whether this dimension is actually getting worse or getting better. And as a consequence, you see, you see the four quadrants. A dimension might be a strength and improving, that would be great. A strength, but deteriorating. And a weakness, which might be improving or deteriorating. So here is the results that we have for the survey. And there is a little bit of a color coding, which I will explain very, uh, very quickly. Um, what you'll see is probably not hugely surprising, but on the other hand, it provides a frame about the magnitude of the issues that we are talking about. First of all, our responses, the respondents feel that management in Europe 
is actually a strength. Also, the context of property rights. You might actually see a smile on this because managers saying, yeah, we are very good, is uh, perhaps uh, uh, self, uh, uh, self self acclaiming. It's interesting, the, 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 the data that has a black dot is data that is placed on the same quadrant from the US survey. So the US executives from HBS also felt that in the US, the management is very good. So again, I think this might be that both uh, across the both sides of the Atlantic management things that they, they themselves are very good. And if you look on the other side, uh, anything that has to do with government, so things like regulation, the tax code complexity, the political system, the macroeconomic the, uh, policy are considered to be weakness and deteriorating. And this is true both by the European respondents as well as by the US respondents. So if you, if you know about Lake Wogergon, this is a situation where all politicians are below average around the world, at, at least according to the business people. Now what is interesting is some of the dimensions in which we might be different relative to the US. So the areas where the Europe is doing better are in blue. So what we see, for example, is that Europe is doing well in basic infrastructure like logistic infrastructure, bridges, roads, trains, and so on, as well as the communications infrastructure. These areas are also perceived to be a strength of the US, but they are perceived to be deteriorating while improving in Europe. And clearly, the role of government in supporting this infrastructure needs to be acknowledged. Second, in terms of the strength, the legal framework and schooling, so pre-university, high school, and so on. So these are, again, social services, which in Europe we provide well, and in the U.S. are considered to either to, to be weaknesses um, or in the, in, for the lack of, of, of social provision. Now, what are the areas in which uh, Europe is not doing quite as well? So you see three points in orange, clusters, the innovation infrastructure, and universities. These are areas that are considered to be currently strengths of Europe, but they are perceived to be deteriorating. Those same points, those same dimensions in the US survey are considered to be strengths and improving. So what you see here is three dimensions in which the US and Europe could potentially be diverging in terms of the future paths. Now the, the dimensions that are most worrisome are the red ones on the bottom uh, left. Those are dimensions, all three, where in the US survey are considered to be strengths and improving in the US context. Those are labor flexibility, entrepreneurship, and capital markets. And here what you see is that our alumni of INSEAD evaluate them as current weaknesses and actually getting worse. And of course, we have been discussing this quite a bit today. Now, I want to very quickly also share some of the key insights about the, the, the interviews that we've been doing with, uh, with Charlie. So the, the, the key insights come uh, across three areas. So in terms of the, um, the market economics, what we saw is that our respondents thought that being in Europe is great. This is a large, sophisticated market. There is a strong supply base. Nobody's saying, okay, I'm gonna leave tomorrow, so they are happy here. But there is a little bit of reticence about making investments, uh, partly because of the macroeconomic situation, but also partly because of the inflexible labor policies, the fragmentation in the market. So it's hard to, to align those investments when other parts of the world are become so attractive. Now, one of the areas where we identified some interesting strategies were some companies that were trying to leverage what we call low-cost Europe. So, for example, some of the German manufacturers, some of the pharma companies are now going to Italy or Eastern Europe to leverage the, quality, the infrastructure quality but also the low cost on these regions in order to be able to provide things that they, they told us were as competitive as going to China, Brazil, or other parts of the world. So that's good news. I mean, within Europe, there are uh, competitive regions. The second dimension that we touch a lot is on the talent. One of the advantages that we found was the fact that European people working in Europe typically are, are, are used to diversity, they manage diversity well, and it's also a good place to attract expatriates. So people around the world like to come to work in Europe. Now, the areas where uh, there are some difficulties is with respect to technical gaps, particularly when it comes to technology of the middle ranks. So there, is a, there are some, some shortages in ICT sector. I'm sure that we will discuss this today. But th those are areas that, that, that need to be covered. And, and in terms of the, uh, the recommendations that we got from the executives, they were related to the educational environment. So how can we make universities uh, be able to develop graduates that are more attuned to the technical and business needs of the, of the market. Finally, when it came to innovation, 
Uh, the general uh, belief of other companies that we talked is that Europe has great pockets of uh, R&D centers, uh, scientific centers, invention. So the raw material is not the problem. The problem tends to be more about the ability of this to turn research into innovation. So the, the process of commercialization that has di been discussed earlier, as well as the entrepreneurial orientation. Even if you are working within a multinational, being entrepreneurial allows you to, uh, to identify the, the opportunities. And this is something that, that was discussed in the previous panel. Now, some of the, the, the interesting policy recommendations that came out from the interviews were, for example, about the integration, the legal integration within the EU. So for example, some, somebody told us about how managing the portfolio of patents in Europe, just keeping them legal and, 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 and uh, uh, available cost the company about 10 times more than doing the same thing in the US. So a more integration of the patent policy might help. The same in cloud computing. And so in some of these technologies, the markets have very fragmented regulation provided a more common European regulation might actually help develop these, these markets. So in terms of the, the recommendations, what came out is Europe and the multinationals in particular need to help us in terms of leveraging our diversity, but also facilitating our economic convergence. So now we have some points to discuss. Uh, let's go to the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Great. Okay, so we have uh, one kickoff question for each of our panelists, and we're going to start with uh, Rajesh. Um, one of the fundamental uh, promises of the EU is for labor mobility, right? So people should be able to move easily across boundaries to seek job opportunities where they exist. Uh, what has been Infosys's experience with labor mobility in Europe? Clearly, you're not you're based in Asia, but you have to deal with labor issues in in Europe. So obviously, uh, obviously, I think. Um, and Javier did not interview a lot of the Infosys people when he made that comment about how it is an attractive place for expats because uh, I really struggle to bring a lot of people from India to Europe. Um, uh, and I think, uh, so I'm going to break this up into three parts. Uh, first is, uh, I think European mobility, of course, is, is easy. And we had, uh, even Jan talked about it, it's easy to take an easy jet flight and, and get to only the cities where easy to operate, which is not everywhere. Um, but uh, but long-term settlement within, within Europe is still a challenge. So for example, we still have to deal with people who are traveling for, for project work, who, who spend some time in, in other cities, have this rule of 180 days. Beyond that, they, they fall into different tax regimes, and it becomes quite complex to manage that situation. But big, more importantly for me, uh, you know, given that you know, we have roughly about 10,000 people in Europe, almost 5,000 of them are local employees, uh, local hires in, this, in the countries. And for me to get them to move from one, one city to another is, 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 is a huge challenge. And uh, a big factor is, uh, is probably education, because uh, the lack of number of international schools, the cost of uh, international schooling in, in most of continental Europe is really prohibitive. So I think uh, we've really struggled when it comes to two aspects. One is uh, ensuring mobility across a very talented and professional workforce uh, of non-European nationals. So, of course, we come from India, so roughly about 5,000 of, of our employees in Europe are of, of Indian or Chinese origin. And for those people, uh, European mobility is a big struggle because they can't easily move from one country to the other. They've got to go back to the base country, reapply for new work permits, and it makes the whole process extremely challenging. Um, within Europe, uh, I think uh, the propensity of people to move and relocate is, is actually quite low. You know, we talk about European mobility um, you know, in, a, in a simple way, but in, in reality, uh, the number of people I have, you know, we have a large center in Poland, we have a large center in, in, in Czech, uh, we have a, a big population in the UK. Uh, to move those people on a long-term basis to, let's say, France or Germany is, is really not attractive, primarily because of the cost of the move, uh, the inflexibility in the, in the local uh, in the markets, and the cost of education. So those are actually big factors uh, which in some ways prohibit mobility uh, today. And especially for a company like Infosys where a lot of work which you do is, uh, in the markets is, is technology-based, is innovation-based, requires us to create centers of excellence where these experts reside in certain centers. For us to be able to freely move these people to leverage the innovation which we are creating in one market and to successfully deploy in another is a very, very critical success factor for the growth of our business. And we are really challenged by, by that particular factor. Thank you, Rajesh. So our next question is for, uh, for Nick. 
Uh, Nick, Google has contributed a lot to our lives, our lifestyles. Uh, my kids do most of their research for school projects uh, through Google first. I, I was going to say Bing as well, but I'm not allowed to say that. Um, how has Europe contributed to Google? Uh, in what sense uh, has, has Google, has, has Europe advanced the quality of uh, Google's offerings and the quality of its services and so on? What have you learned here? Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. And good afternoon. A um, couple of things I think really interesting happening inside Google as we as we're going into different markets is different markets have different um, uh, issues and they have different strengths. Uh, you might have seen last week we launched a, a network of balloons um, uh, to provide internet access to um, uh, places that don't have it, um, underdeveloped countries. Uh, interestingly, coming from Australia, they chose New Zealand as a place to launch it, which I thought was. <laughs> Um, which I thought was appropriate, actually. Um, but, uh, but when coming to France, it's very... Uh, I think one of the things, obviously, that France has a tremendous history in is culture. And when... And Google saw an opportunity to uh, think about how do you combine Google's technology and uh, bringing access to information to the world with culture. And the natural place to do that, because you want to work with the very, very best people on the planet uh, when you're taking on a project like that, and so the Cultural Institute uh, is being built in France and we're working with hundreds of institutions around the world but uh, the first institutions that we've been working with are all the, uh, the big names of, uh, of, of, uh, of the French uh, cultural wealth. So I think that's a great example. It's called the Google Arc Project. is one, of the, one manifestation of that. 250 institutions around the world now have uh, their works online uh, through that, through that uh, offering. And uh, I think it's a really, uh, we're learning a lot from that, um, but I think we're also contributing something back to uh, suddenly giving access to uh, the works of um, many, many museums around the world to the entire planet. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so my, my last question before we open it up is to Nunzio. Um, we usually don't say ICT companies in Europe in the same sentence. Um, is there a competitive advantage to an ICT company? <laughs> Uh, being headquartered and located uh, in uh, in Europe, uh, that is, does, does the diversity of Europe uh, benefit you in any way? Yeah, thank you, Charlie. No, first of all, thanks a lot for inviting me. I I found uh, uh, very very interesting to be in the audience and listen to the other panelists. Uh, really, really great. A lot of passion, a lot of optimist. Actually, uh, more than I expected, uh, which is good. So Ericsson, Ericsson is a global player. So we are, uh, we have operations in 180 countries. We were born in Sweden. Actually, Javier, we were born 1876. So we might be your uh, in your slide as well. The founder was Lars Magnus Ericsson. He had a vision. Uh, his vision was that communication uh, will contribute to a better world, and that was 140 years ago. So it was a great vision, which is still valid. But uh, headquartered in Sweden, and uh, we have 110,000 employees and 43,000 employees in, in Europe. So Europe is important for us. Uh, we have huge R&D in, uh, in Europe, 14,000 employees working in research and development, out of 25,000. And we have centers in uh, UK, in Germany, in Spain, Italy, Finland. So we are in Europe. Then Europe as ecosystem, a lot of the leading ICT companies are based in Europe. Uh, some of the global operators, which are leading uh, among the operators in the world, I can name them, France Telecom, Telefonica, Deutsche Telekom, Vodafone, and company like Ericsson, for example, they are part of this ecosystem. On top of that, I think, uh, and that was said largely in the afternoon, the people in Europe, they have great competence, the leaders in Europe, they are good leader. We heard Zara CEO, he was talking about people and he was talking about customer first. So the customer first attitude, I think it's very strong in Europe. And when you put the customer on stage and the people on stage, it's a good start to progress from. Uh, Europe's continent is an high tech continent with a lot of early adopters, people in Europe, take the new technology. They like uh, to, to use new technology. They like to evolve. They, they like to innovate. So obviously, being in this ecosystem, we are part of that ecosystem. We do experience a lot of best practice. A lot of things happen first in Europe. 
they are industrialized in Europe and then exported all over in the world. So that's why we believe to be Europe is important. And if you want to qualify as a leading company in the ICT industry, I don't think you can qualify if you don't qualify in Europe as well. All right, thank you. If I can just stay with this theme a little bit more before we, before we move on. And this is an open question to, to all three of you. It, uh, I'd love to hear from all three if you wish. Why hasn't Europe produced an information age company the size of Apple or Google or Microsoft or Samsung now in Korea? Uh, what's missing? Europe is very technological, but why aren't we able to create some of these giant information age companies? Who would like to try that? Uh, I think y when you look at the valley, Silicon Valley, obviously there's some things there which, are, which make it very fertile ground. Um, a culture where, uh, this is an interesting thing being uh, uh, coming from where I'd come from, failure is not very well accepted in 98% of the planet. But uh, the valley is a place where, uh, you know, it truly is part of the culture. And you see that inside Google. Many things we try don't work. Um, but, uh, but there's always a question of how do we take uh, what we can learn from that uh, experience and, uh, and build on it. And it's actually a very interesting cultural thing. And then, of course, there's all the stuff about capital flows, proximity, um, you know, the deep base of venture capital, which is not just money, but expertise on how to do this stuff, uh, NASDAQ. There's a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and, uh, but, I think you're, but I think it's also important to recognise um, that Europe does produce things like Airbus, A380, TGV. So um, this is not a continent which uh, doesn't have a, a great history of technology development in its own right, um, but uh, it's configured differently from the way uh, the US is configured. Maybe also, if we talk about the ecosystem and we think about uh, Google or we think about the connected or network society where every, everyone is getting connected, uh, getting access to the, to the applications and so on, Obviously, in the ecosystem, then you have also industries that are building networks, like Ericsson or others, and the Cisco, Ericsson, Alcatel, and System, which are part of the ecosystem. Without that technology, without investment in that technology, the rest might not exist. So we are all part of the same ecosystem that is growing. And you also have cycle, obviously. You know, I think, um, I think there are multiple aspects to this. One is, uh, I think the comparison between America and, and the US and, and Europe is, is actually unfair because Europe is not just you know one country, one, one culture, one, it's 27 expanding. Um, and, uh, and I think there is, uh, there's a lot of nationalist pride and, and the need to create national champions and therefore the investments which are getting created are, are in, my way, in my view very siloed. Right. So, for example, what has been uh, what the U.S. has been able to create by creating an ecosystem like the Silicon Valley, which is uh, which has the best universities, which attracts talent from across the globe, uh, and creates in some ways a melting pot of talent uh, with funding and with uh, with a will to to achieve. And I think, uh, uh, given the uh, traditional conservatism which you have in Europe, it's more uh, conservative. It is more risk averse, et cetera. And some of these success companies you talk about, and I think uh, I think you talked about a statistics of 95%. Uh, I think Filippo talked about a statistic of 95% failures. And uh, uh, that's because there have been so many attempts at so many different ideas and so many different uh, streams. Uh, and having that ecosystem of talent, ecosystem of funding, ecosystem of universities and talent from across the world coming there, I think it's been an amazing uh, uh, reason for, for, for this kind of growth. I don't think we've created anything similar to that in Europe. Uh, I think uh, even today, uh, some of the, you know, I think UK to some extent and specific London has, has done a lot in attracting talent from outside. I don't think Paris has attracted that kind of talent or even, even the multiple hubs we have in Germany has done nothing anywhere close to attracting the kind of global talent which the US has succeeded in doing. And I think that's probably the single biggest factor uh, which has helped in creation of these global giants. Right. So we're hearing a lot of the same themes that we heard from the previous session, in fact. Very similar issues for MNCs as we heard from the uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, and Europe, of course, expands by one on Monday, 28. I think Croatia enters the, enters the fold. So at this point, we will open it up um, to questions from the audience. Uh, I see a hand uh, 
way in the back in the corner. Gentlemen. Kimon um, Balaskakis, former Canadian ambassador to the OECD. In thinking about the ecosystems for competitiveness, should we or should we not include the social dimension? Uh, I mean, after all, Europe has taken 250 years for the Industrial Revolution to become a social revolution and start equalizing and the rise of the middle class. And now with globalization, things appear to be in reverse. Uh, what would you answer someone from a civil society group would say, perhaps the best way for competitiveness is to have extremely low wages, use machines, and forget about social cohesion and social aspects. Uh, my question is, should we include these or should we exclude these under the drive to become as competitive as we can? There, there's a central question. Um, I'm gonna stick with this one before we go to the next one because I think it's quite quite important. Love to get your yeah. views. Yeah, I, can, mm -hmm. I can start. No, I, I believe, first of all, to answer to your question, I think if you, if you are leading a company and you want to succeed, uh, then you need uh, you need to have the attitude, uh, first of all, to accept the conditions you have, to accept the competitors you have, to be open to competition and open to the system, whatever system you have in uh, whatever country. That attitude, because if you find, try to find excuses, then obviously you are not going to make it. If you do that, and you do that well, try to do your best with what you have, try to compete, try to increase productivity, and more specifically, when it comes to the cost of labor, it's only one component. Then you need to look also at the competence, you need to look at the productivity, you need to look at the engagement of the people, how much the people really give to the company. That is also important. If you do that well, and then it happens also that the flexibility in the labor increase, then you will find yourself with an extra, an extra asset. So I'm not saying that it will not be nice to have more flexibility in the work or a, a kind of common frame or more common in Europe that will for sure help. But I think the attitude has to fight with what we have first and then maybe influence for the future as well. And then if that goes well, then you have even more competitive advantage. Anyone else? No, I think, um, you know, uh, my personal view is that um, without productivity and, and therefore creating competitiveness, long-term prosperity is not possible, right? Uh, and in across the era, if you notice, we have always created productivity improvements through automation of some sort. Um, and, and, and we've used humans uh, to, to do I would, what I would call more knowledge work or more insight, insightful work, um, et cetera. And that is, that is what has helped us create this, this prosperous environment we're living in today. So I think, uh, 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 and I think we should try and decouple you know, uh, automation and wages because I don't think they, they, they go together. But I think uh, ultimately, if if, um, uh, if if we if we need to to create a more prosperous uh, environment, we need to be able to attract and and employ uh, people across all different social strata and different ages. And I think that's where we're struggling today. We're struggling with creating jobs for for young for our young people, um, and that's primarily because we're not making enough investments in newer areas. Investments are lacking. Companies are holding on to. Uh, to their excess cash, they're not investing, and that's primarily because there's uncertainty about the short term. And I think as long as we're able to free up that uncertainty and, and, make, and, and encourage companies to invest, we will be able to create that environment where we will be able to drive a lot more jobs. So I think we have to delink this, this equation and, and focus on actually opening up more towards the knowledge economy, focus more on the investments which are going to drive you know, um, jobs in the, in the long term. And I think that is where we are going to be able to create a more prosperous uh, and uh, sustainable economy. Vic, do you want to yeah, try I might, this one I as well? I uh, might uh, not talk about money for a second, but actually talk about some of the other social goods which I think can come with uh, technology innovation, which I think is just... Uh, now this is a subject on which we are extremely optimistic. Uh, I think when you look at what's happened um, to the world through uh, things like Wikipedia, um, search where suddenly information's become freely available. I was trying to explain to my 10-year-old daughter, she actually asked me what, would, what was doing school projects like before Wikipedia and I actually explained the process and the look of horror um, <laughs> on her face was just fantastic. But I think what you're seeing there, and, but 
the way social equity is constructed in this new world is very different from how it's been constructed in the old world. I'll give you one example. A uh, very successful French uh, YouTube artist, a guy called Yusufa, who's a black rapper. Uh, I, was, I met him a couple of months ago. And he was saying to me, you know, I w he could never get a start from the big labels because uh, they didn't like his stuff. So he said, okay, I'll just go and do some stuff on YouTube. And now he's built a fantastic audience and business because we split the revenue from the ads with him. Uh, an audience not just in France but all through Africa. Uh, more than half of his audience is coming from Africa. And now he says, well, you know, now I get calls from the big labels asking me if I'd like anything. I'm um, doing okay. Thank you. And, uh, and I think it's just very interesting because there's a big shift in power that's happened there. One has gone from uh, who's the person who's making the decision about what people on the world should watch? Is it the guys running the TV networks or are we actually going to let the people have a have make the decision? So, there's, so I think the free-flowing information, what's going to happen with that? What, does that? what does that make available? What does that do to Africa? What does it do to kids in this country who haven't got a chance <coughs> for, for whatever reason? from some sort of form of exclusion uh, when they're given the tools free uh, to do things. I think it's very exciting. So I'm very optimistic about what will happen socially, but it's going to change things. Great, thank you. I think the common thing that I heard amongst your answers is, is we have to look long, long term. Uh, in short term, inevitably, will there be some pain uh, as we reform, but the long term uh, ambitions are, are, are right. Um, other questions? There's a lady right there. I'm kind of going from left to right across the room. There's a lady right there, yeah. Hi, I'm Soraya from Malaysia. My question will probably be for you to think beyond what you are doing. I think what I want to ask is, what will it take for multinationals to play a more prominent role in terms of creating a larger and more significant innovation footprint, so to say, in terms of stimulating innovation around multinationals? Now, I think for the three speakers up here, your companies have very well established platforms already which are already creating ripples throughout in terms of startups, in terms of the SMEs around. But what will it take for more uh, multinational companies actually to play a much more prominent role to stimulate the innovation ecosystem? All right, thank you. I'm going to take one more question and then our panel can have a choice. Gentlemen right here. Yeah. Larry Moffat with the European Young Innovators Forum. Uh, the short answer to the question about what uh, Europe has given Google uh, seems to be museums. Uh, I'm just wondering, since we have a uh, representative from Ericsson, why couldn't it have been uh, Europe's leadership in mobile telephony? Why did Google end up teaming up with Samsung and HTC and not with uh, Ericsson or Nokia? And isn't there a fundamental problem there? So we have two questions. One is on MNC's contribution to innovation, which couples with the previous panel, or ICT. So who would like to? Yeah, I can take yeah. it away. I can answer first to the Ericsson question, and uh, uh, <laughs> I think I have to answer, <laughs> unless you want to help me. <laughs> no, so uh, I mean, our, uh, no, our vision has been, uh, since a long time, uh, we, we, we believe in the network society, where everything that uh, will get benefit uh, from being connected, will actually be connected. And we heard this is now happening. That was our simple vision. And for us, the enabler for this vision were three things. One, the mobility, so the possibility for the user to get access to their software, to their things, to whatever, in uh, any place. The second is the broadband, so also broadband in mobility. And the number three was the cloud. And as Ericsson, we have been investing in all these three domains. And the result of that is that we are, because that was our mission, was to be the number one in, in networks and the number one in services in the telecom industry. And there we are. And obviously, when it comes to the cloud, I mean, we are the fifth uh, software company around the world. That is not that much known. So we are part of that ecosystem. Maybe we are the number five company in terms of software sales. And obviously, when it comes to software, then we have also Google, and we have many, many others. But we are there as number five in the cloud, investing in OSS and BSS, because we believe that enterprises need to invest a lot in IT in order 
for them to grow and to increase their productivity. Uh, so we are not in the Google space, but we are in the space we, were, we wanted to be. So we are going according to our ambition. And uh, the second question, maybe I should not take all the, all the, all the time, so maybe I can ask you, or I can, I can also answer to that. We understand, I don't know, you want to take it? Okay, no, sorry. I, on the innovation, it's extremely important, and I think as a company, we fully understand that we have also a social responsibility, and that social responsibility is on top of our, of our agenda uh, at CEO level, at my level, all level in the company. Uh, to answer with something specific, in my, in my region, for example, we do promote two programs, one in Italy called uh, EGO, Ericsson Go, and one in Spain called Talentum, and what we do uh, we obviously help start up, and we have started 10 years ago uh, because we understood that was extremely important, I mean, for us and also for, 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 for the country because if the country goes well, we go well together with the country, obviously. And what we do with this program, we simply offer a house to the new guys, to the entrepreneur. We don't give money, we give house, like the parents. And then what we do in our house, uh, we try, obviously, to help them to assess their business case and to help them to be successful in the market. So from that point of view, we are, we are acting and I, I, I support what you say. It's important. Others on this? So I think uh, I'm not gonna to respond to the second question because uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I think uh, you know, uh, multinationals have an extremely critical role to play when it comes to uh, uh, creating hubs of innovation and nurturing uh, entrepreneurship. And uh, um, and I do think that a lot of companies do that already because, uh, and they don't do it, do it because of goodwill alone, because uh, I think there's also benefit for the multinationals when they do that. I mean, uh, if you look at some of the solutions which we as Infosys have created, uh, the success of the solution largely depends on fomenting and creating hubs of, of entrepreneurship across the supply chain to make it a success. I mean, I can take an example of of a solution called mobile wallet, which we which we created um, in India, you know, we unfortunately have a huge population uh, of unbanked people. People don't have bank accounts, um, and that number ranges in the range of 600 million to 800 million people, which is a huge number of people. Um, and of course, we have a similar number of large number of unbanked people in Africa, where we are again trying to look at deploying the solution. So. Here we are looking at how do we create a, a banking system which is completely based on just mobile technology because a lot of these people live in villages where there are no banks, there are no ATMs, there's this, this very very difficult way to transact. And in a lot of ways it also detracts from the overall economy because it's, it's therefore a cash-based economy and that takes away vital revenues for, for, for the government. And I think uh, uh, we work with the leading telecom provider, but along with that we also have created a network of almost 2,000 small enterprises who help us in the deployment of the solution, in the sustaining the solutions and deploying it, training it, et cetera. And, and that has probably ended up in, in creation of multiple, you know, thousands of, of new jobs. And innovation around it, because once the platform is available, it can be used for multiple things. It doesn't have to be restricted only to, to finance, but it can be extended across, you know, order management or, or products, et cetera. So I think uh, uh, companies like Infosys do a lot in, in fostering and developing an economy, not only for just the products and solutions which are beneficial to the company's growth, but also other things where, for example, we are investing a significant amount of money in, in propagating education, education in the, some of the southern hemisphere in some of the underprivileged countries, where we are trying to create networks of, of sharing where we can, so for example, we partnered with, uh, uh, with the UNESCO to create a, a open source platform for sharing the educational material on a much larger base, right? But that is more, you know, you can only do, uh, you know, you can do free stuff, pro bono stuff to a certain level. But beyond that, I think uh, it has to make economic sense for the multinational. But I think there is a genuine need for multinationals to create and, and foster ecosystems and eco hubs of innovation and entrepreneurship around their supply chain to make them more effective and, and pervasive. Yeah, I think we take a, a similar approach, actually. I mean, obviously, we do work with startups um, in Paris, Berlin, London. Uh, the US, New York, uh, and, and many other places. But equally, I think um, uh, one of the things that we always look for is speed. And uh, we have, um, you know, 
a, a good workforce, good sized workforce at Google. But the, the thing is, how do you build platforms that other people can build on top of? Uh, so I think there are examples are things like Android, um, where you've got obviously you know platforms that telcos can use, um, but also people who create content can can use it. I think that's one of the things that we we look for is so if you think think you may love them or you may hate them, but the Google ads that appear on websites, I mean there's millions of websites who use that, and that's that's a platform which we make available. Uh, the websites make money, which helps them to reinvest. So because I think you can you can do if you can create. Um, uh, systems, big systems where you can align the incentives and actually uh, put money into the system, that's that's the very best thing because then the people who are building their own little websites are actually making money and can reinvest, build a big website um, and that helps um, fuel the whole system. And, you know, and there's self-interest in it, of course. You know, we do well when a bigger, richer web is good for Google but um, equally it's good for a lot of other people in the process. More questions, one down here. Gentleman, right in the front. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Miguel Sanz, and now I am jobless. Uh, I used to work for a multinational and three, three weeks ago for Honeywell. I was laid off together with another 30 meet-up executives in Europe. And I wanted to ask you, about two things, it, it, it's maybe the two aspects of, of the same thing, which is what I perceive, maybe it's my bias, Javier, because I have been laid off, so maybe it's my bias, but uh, as what I perceive in multinationals, moreover in American listed companies, which is the creation of bottom line in the short term, but the destruction of value for the future, and the difficulty of being an entrepreneur inside, at least when you are not in the core business. My business unit was 600 million euro business. The business I led, which is energy efficiency in Europe, was only 5% of that, but was growing at 40% for the last two years. But when your house is in fire, <laughs> you don't care about the 5%. And, and I think if, if big multinationals destroy value in the short term, then for mid-sized companies, there is a future in Europe. I think we'll stick with this question. Um, <laughs> uh, so this was part of a larger move by Honeywell to reduce its footprint in Europe. Is that right, or My business, my business. just your business here? Okay, yeah. gentlemen. First of all, I guess you have a lot of experience. So first suggestion: send your CV, <laughs> and that's for sure. <laughs> No, I mean, that those things happen, so obviously. I mean, the market is uh, high, highly competitive, so there are, uh, there are companies that don't make it. I mean, and there are companies that have more uh, medium, long-term, long-term mission. So, I mean, my company is, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm maybe lucky. I'm in a company that has been there for a long time and uh, have a uh, uh, good balance between uh, short and long-term vision. And uh, that, that is obviously important. I understand that. When it comes to yourself, I think uh, if I understand the experience you have accumulated, I guess your experience is very valuable, maybe outside Spain or uh, and when we talk about mobility. So that's for sure, because the world is growing in uh, many dimensions and in many business. And uh, it's always, as you said, it's not so easy to get competent people from Europe uh, to go out of Europe or to move, because it's a nice place to be, obviously. And uh, so. I don't know, indirectly giving you some suggestions. I mean. I think, uh, I'm sorry to hear about that. And uh, uh, I think it can happen to any of us. And it, I don't think it reflects at all on you as a person or your competency, et cetera. I think uh, uh, these are all difficult times, uh, difficult times for most companies. And, and when, and it's unfortunate that it's difficult times. And I think a lot of it is, you know, I think, uh, uh, the previous panelists talked about the mentality, and I think a, a big part of the problem in Europe is the mentality, is the negative mindset, is the fact that we are we are constrained by the short term, you know, cycles and not looking at the, you know. I think in, in you know, we will, if we were all given a time machine and and said, you know, you can go, you know, three years into the future, um, I don't think uh, any of our top five problems three years from now we would even be able to articulate today, right? Uh, there'll be new problems, different ones. 
Um, so I think companies have a have a have a uh, you know they have they have to share un, you know I, I mean I don't know the specifics of your business but I mean I, I, I mean I manage a 800 million dollar business within Infosys and we routinely have to invest in creating new businesses to try new solutions new services I invest uh, you know 15 20 million dollars every year in creating something new and and trying to take it into market and and most of them fail. Right? And, and over a period of time, I have to shed it off. I don't lay off people. I, I retrain them on other stuff, and, and, and we move on. But that's, that's the nature of the game. Right? You have to uh, constantly look at trying, you know, pushing, the, pushing the frontier, looking at newer technologies, looking at newer solutions, looking at lower client bases, trying new geographies. I mean, that's, that's the nature of the beast. Unfortunately, we have to have a finite timeline in which you can invest. You need to have a very meticulous way in which you measure. Otherwise, you can endlessly keep investing and throwing good money after bad, and that's not a good that's not a good way of, of running business. And it's not my money; it's the shareholders' money which we're playing with, right? So we need to be extra careful. So we have a fiduciary responsibility to to do our best job as managers to to manage the business. But I mean, I, honestly, I believe that uh, uh, you know sometimes we tend to stray a little too far away from our core competencies and our core. Uh, core uh, core of our business, and I think that's when we are taking risk because we get more we are more under leveraged. We don't have the scale to deal with it, and that's when potentially we have no choice but to let go of some of these businesses. Um, so I don't really think of it as a bad thing. Um, I think uh, referring to the issue of unemployment as well, because I think this is a comment which I wanted to make earlier, and I and I kind of lost the plot in uh, in the example, is that I think we have to distinguish between job security and employment security. And I think that's a very critical factor. Right? A lot of times, you know, especially in, in, the, in, in the Western Europe uh, in, you know, scenario, in France, in Germany, in some of the markets, you know, the job security itself is, is given a lot of importance. Right? So people, you know, once they're in a job, they know that they're secure, they can't be fired. And, and therefore, even, they, even though they might believe that they have better, better opportunities elsewhere, they can do better elsewhere, they're kind of saying, you know, this is my, you know, you know and, and I got this great example because I was talking to, uh, a young colleague of mine, you know, 22, 23 years old, uh, joined us in, in our office in France, and I wanted to send him to a very interesting project in Brazil. And he said, no, but if I go there, you know, what happens to my social security protection in France? And I'm like, you're 22 years old, right? <laughs> the social security system in France is bankrupt or will be soon, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, what are you thinking about? So, uh, so I think we really have to change the, the, the mindset on that. And, and sorry. I? No, 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 please. <laughs> we're, we're almost there. Okay, Nick, you're off the hook on this one. I'm gonna go for one more question. Uh, there was a gentleman uh, right there. We'll take this gentleman right here. I was on the executive board of Siemens. And uh, I know that we can achieve productivity across Europe independent of the country. I mean, most national, multinationals have an approach to business that is transferred from country to country to country. So independent of the country, you achieve a certain productivity. So we get into a situation where companies may be productive, but the country is not. And 15 years ago, we had the same situation in Germany. We were always feeling that Industry is doing fine. Indeed, we can go anywhere and we invest in Asia and we invest in the growth areas, but not in Germany because Germany has conditions that were not fine. This changed and um, there was a rather drastic change in the labor market in other areas. It's much talked about. Today we have a situation, I think, where, and this turns to my question, does that have an impact on our growth and investment behavior if countries are not competitive? despite the fact that our individual companies can be competitive. And how is that influencing our corporate behavior? I Personally, I felt there was simply no choice anymore. You simply went to the growth areas. It didn't do so much in, in Europe when the country was not so competitive. Um, I think there is a danger, and I wonder how we best address that danger. How can we change that? That Europe is attractive again for investment in all places, because we have productive and growing countries. So just some very quick responses on this. I think we're passing the buck to the regulators and politicians slowly as the day goes on, but <laughs> any quick uh, comments on this? Yeah. No, 
I think uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I think uh, the the challenge which we have uh, in in growing markets uh, which are naturally not prone to growth is is a big struggle. Uh, but I think uh, some of these markets require resilience, right? Uh, I mean, I think we've, uh, as Infosys, we, we first started operations in France 15 years ago, and it's still not reached anywhere close to the potential we would like it to. And we've kind of tried different models, and we've changed it around, and we've you know tried different approaches. And, uh, and I don't think, and we're still not very happy with what we do in this market, but we're not going away. Because, you know, there are some markets where you have to be in there for the long run. You have to you have to figure it out. N you know, failing is not an option. And I think blaming the country for for not being being uh, productive or not being a, in a, a container for success is not an acceptable excuse. So I think uh, we have to keep trying and we have to try different things in different measures and, and different kind of investments and approach it from the flanks and and see how you deal with it. And I think I really believe that's what that's the right answer because I don't think you have a choice of excluding the top 10 economies of the world today and the top 10 economies of the world tomorrow. You need to be present. If you want to be a global multinational, you have to compete on all these, all these, and simultaneously, unfortunately. And, and that's the only way to do it. Actually, uh, we, we, are, we are running time in the, in, against time. We have another panel that is coming up. So, so I, th I think the, this, this point uh, is quite important to summarize, in fact, the, the impact of multinationals. Um, uh, because they are bringing best practices, they bring management techniques to, to countries that may, may not have do those. Uh, that reminds me of the, the work of a colleague, uh, I didn't say, uh, sitting here, Mar Maria Guadalupe, she, she did a study looking at the productivity impact of foreign M&A uh, in local, local countries. So, so th this, is, this is a very, very important thing that, to, to study. Um, I would like to, to wrap up uh, by thanking our uh, panelists, uh, Nuncio, uh, Rajesh, uh, and Nick, and particularly Charlie for, for moderating and sharing the, the recess with me. Thank you very much. Thank you.